Good morning, church, and welcome to our worship on this sixth Sunday of the Easter season. We are grateful to be with you, whether it be in person here in the parking lot or via the internet. Forty days Jesus showed himself alive and then ascended into heaven. This Thursday is Ascension Day. And then ten days following his ascension, he sent the Holy Spirit as promised. We'll read of the coming of that Holy Spirit in our Gospel reading today. Life is not always easy, though, and especially as we struggle with the continuing effects of the coronavirus and all that it means. How wonderful to know that God is with us, especially in times of suffering. And that's what we're going to focus on today in our sermon. Alleluia! Christ is risen! We sing the opening hymn, Now That Day Daylight Fills the Skies. make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Even as we glory in the gift of eternal life, in that hope we spend our days in joyful repentance and faith. Let us then confess our sin, the sin that so easily besets us, and receive the full forgiveness our Lord daily provides for us. Lord God, though the strife is over, the battle done, and now is the victor's triumph won, sin still hangs on. We are your baptized people. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us into our Easter joy. People of God, upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, proclaim the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing the hymn of praise. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding accomplish them through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today from Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both, both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where he said to them, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are in every way very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands, 
as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. We are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Kids, it's time for a special message for you. Are you ready? Are you out there? All right, yeah. You're here this morning, and I'm glad for that. Want to think about 
suffering for a minute today. What is suffering? Well, it's when things don't go right and we feel bad because of it, and sometimes when we even get hurt. So there's different kinds of suffering, aren't there? Now, have you ever done something and gotten in trouble for it? Yeah, that happens sometimes, doesn't it? And it doesn't feel very good, and we try to avoid it, but it comes, and sooner or later we have to pay the price. It might be getting grounded for a while, or it might be losing a privilege. Maybe uh, that, well, it just doesn't feel good, does it? But you know what feels even worse? is if somebody else does something and we get blamed for it. Wow, that feels pretty bad, doesn't it? And then if we get in trouble because of it, that really hurts, doesn't it? Well, think about this for a minute. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Jesus always did the right thing. And yet what happened to him? He was crucified. He took the punishment we deserved. That was, had to hurt not just physically, but it had to hurt his heart as well. That would have been tough, wouldn't it? He did nothing wrong, but he suffered for us. And that's the good news, because you know that suffering didn't get him. He rose on the third day, and that's the good news we have now to tell. Sometimes when we tell that good news, we are going to suffer for it. And that's what we're going to think about in the sermon in just a moment. For now, let's move on with the hymn of the day, O oh, for a Faith That Will Not Shrink. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text today is the epistle reading from 1 Peter chapter 3. 
Peter was writing to a number of churches who were troubled. He was writing to them during a very troubled time. Hmm, can we relate to that? Writing to those different churches in different places with different uh, cultures, and yet they were having the same problem, and that's what he wanted to address, particularly in this text today. And that is the problem of the difficulty of discipleship. The question that he was addressing is, how can I live my life in the world as a Christian? How can I do that with integrity? How can I do that in the face of suffering? Peter invites us today to remember that God's grace and God's glory come to us in Christ. That is what helps us deal with our difficulties in discipleship. You know, Christians can sometimes interpret the suffering that we endure simply because we're Christians as if it's something that we have done wrong. Imagine for a moment, if you will, a couple maybe like Laura and I, somebody that's a little older, somebody that's uh, been around the block a few times. We, uh, we have uh, friends. We've gone through a lot of things with them. Maybe it's a couple that's been somewhere for uh, many decades. They've traveled together with families they're close to. Uh, they've gone to sports events of various kinds. They've watched the kids grow up and graduate and move on to jobs or the military or college and eventually there come the weddings that they celebrate together and the uh, events that follow that maybe even children and grandchildren to rejoice in now with all of those things that they've shared together you would think that things would be good among them and as we know not every human life is going to be easy, but uh, for the most part, we have those close friends that we can really rely on. But all of a sudden, we find that everything has changed. What's changed? Well, everything seems so political nowadays. This couple tries to talk kindly and gently about their Christian faith with their dear friends of many years, maybe going all the way back to high school years that they've known them. But talking about faith puts a strain on their relationships with others. And they're wondering if they should just keep their faith to themselves. I must be doing something wrong, they might think. Having friends that you can be honest with shouldn't be this hard. Should it? Well, sometimes it is. When our Lord calls us to follow him, he called us to take up our cross. Discipleship is not easy. It wasn't for Peter. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for you. Satan tempts us to believe that we're doing something wrong, because if we're Christians, then life ought to be easier, shouldn't it? And if it's not, well, then maybe we should just uh, move on and keep quiet about our faith, keep our heads low and avoid the controversy. Peter, however, offers us a different view of things today and encourages us to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Why do we need to do this? How can we do this? Well, we need to do this because God loves everyone. And we, be, we can do it because we know the power of God that is ours in Jesus Christ. Peter's inspired words point us to a better way of dealing with the difficulties of discipleship by pointing us back to Christ. So what do you do when you think about 
or excuse me, what do you think about when you think about the Apostle Peter? Do you think of how Peter walked on the water when he was so bold to and then fell in when he turned his eyes from Jesus? Do you think about that time when Jesus told him, you've been fishing all night, I know you haven't caught a thing, throw your nets out one more time on this side of the boat instead. And then they caught all those fish. Do you remember how he claimed that he would follow Jesus all the way to death and then turned on him in the courtyard of the uh, high priest when he was in danger? Do you remember how he preached so powerfully that first Pentecost as he proclaimed the good news of the risen and living Lord Jesus and called people to repent and believe in him? Peter's life, it was rich and it was varied and he had a very special and unique calling that he could give us some insight into how to live this life of discipleship. Peter does not ask us to consider what he did as a disciple. Rather, he invites us to remember Jesus. Later in his epistle, Peter writes, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. Witness of the sufferings of Christ. That's what it's all about. Peter doesn't want us to remember him for what he said or did, but rather as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. That's what it's really all about. As a witness of Christ, Peter was had seen the most amazing love of all, the most amazing love the world has ever seen, a self-sacrificing love that went far beyond what any struggle we might have might be. That's what the struggle of discipleship is really all about, witnessing to the sufferings of Christ. Peter saw how God enters into suffering in the person of Christ, and he saw how God is able to see us beyond suffering because, you see, suffering is not the ultimate end. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of grace and a kingdom of glory. It's a kingdom of grace here and now, and we rejoice in that because we suffer. And so Peter reminds those who suffer that God works salvation through suffering. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Through Christ's sufferings, we are made Christians. We are brought to God. Without the sufferings of Christ, we would remain in our sins, separated from God by what we say and think and do, contrary to his will, to his law. But because of the sufferings of Christ, because of his death for us on the cross, God's righteous wrath over sin is satisfied. God is a just God. He must punish sin, but he already has. He laid it all on the righteous one for us so that we might now live under God's grace and his reign and rule. Jesus took on suffering. He struggled with the power of sin, death, and the devil. He died that we might be saved and he now lives that we might know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No suffering that we endure. No, nothing can overcome God's work in the world and he is very much at work in our world. Jesus is able to enter into our suffering and work through that suffering to bring about the good that God wants to bring to all people especially when discipleship is difficult, we can endure with the confidence that Christ knows. God knows and he cares. Our Savior Jesus Christ entered into suffering 
for his purposes and because of his presence and love and because we know that he knows about suffering, we don't need to fear it or to flee from it. Rather, we can follow Jesus with confidence, the confidence of faith that he is always, always with us, with his power and mercy and love. Because Jesus stands between his disciples and the realm of evil, because he stands between you and me and all that could separate us from God, he has already taken on the forces of darkness and nothing is going to be able to separate us from Jesus. Jesus is already victorious. He's triumphed over the grave, over every evil, and now that suffering, when it comes to us, is already conquered. It's been defeated by him. It has to come through him first before it comes to us. This is how Peter invites us to view our lives now, lives of discipleship, when suffering enters our lives. The difficulties that endangered Jesus, yeah, they're going to come to us too as we follow him and bear faithful witness to him. Our world doesn't like it. Our world does not want to be called out for its sin. But there's a bigger picture than just that, isn't there? It is the love of God at work in the world. Think about what that looks like. Think about this. A young adult who has recently graduated, as many uh, celebrated this past week. Think about the world that's awaiting that young adult as they try to live a Christian life. Perhaps they find that it's difficult to bear witness to Christ as they live out that life of faith. They try with gentleness and respect as Peter advises to share their faith, but they find that they're often put down for it, that they struggle with doing so faithfully. Yes, they want to, but it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it's pretty difficult to do. And it's not just young people either, is it? So easily we turn aside from those opportunities we have to share our faith. Remember your confirmation day? Remember what it was like to get up in front of the congregation and share the fact that you believe in God the Father, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit who gives and seals and empowers our faith. Remember what that was like and how exciting that was? So easily we forget that. We did that in front of folks who love us, fellow Christians who truly do care how th that set us apart and how much we need to remember that as we seek to share our faith with those who are not Christians. We have a family of faith that we can go back to. We have a family of faith that we stand within so that as we share our faith with the world, it may know that there is a God who loves. And as we share our faith and find difficulty and suffering, we rejoice because it's not our own goodness or gifts, no matter how great and wonderful and plentiful they might be that we witness to. No, we witness to God who loves us with an everlasting love who rose in victory over sin and death, who lives, and now the victory's already won. Faith in Him, that's how we deal with the difficulties of discipleship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Now I invite you to join me in confessing our common Christian faith in the true triune God in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In that confident faith, let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for the new life and salvation with which you have brought beauty into our lives and our world through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray that you open the ears of all who hear your word, that this salvation may come to many in true repentance and faith, the gift of your own Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send your Spirit mightily, especially upon those called to preach and teach your life-giving word. Guide all pastors, teachers, and servants of the church to be fruitful in word and deed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. To all who bear the authority of government in our land, give your blessing that tranquility and peace rule our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When suffering for your truth comes our way, remind us of the certain victory that is ours by our baptism into Christ. Give us the vision of your mercy and grace that we endure any opposition to the true faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Visit with your peace and healing all who suffer illness, injury, or any painful difficulty. We pray especially this morning for Lila, who remains hospitalized and is struggling with pneumonia. We pray for Lisa and Glo and Betty as they deal with cancer and it, its effects and treatment in their lives. We give thanks with Don, who has endured uh, chemo or dialysis, and we pray your blessing on him as he moves on from that milestone into uh, new and healthier days. We pray for those others whose names and needs are known to us, whom we bring before you now, Lord, in silence. Let not their hearts be troubled or weighed down with any fear, but lift their eyes to you for your sure and certain promises of eternal life and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With reverence and affection, we remember before you, O everlasting God, all our departed family and friends who have followed Christ and are now with him in glory. By your grace, keep us faithful and steadfast that we see the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the members of our congregation, and especially for Jim and Joyce, Billy and Shannon, Orletha, Mike and Glenda and their families, that the Spirit might fill them and empower them to share the love of Jesus with others, we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you leave the parking lot this morning or as you at home consider the blessings of our Lord, remember that uh, the work of the church goes on. You may leave your offering with the uh, elders as you leave today or mail it in or give through the electronic means that's available on our website. And if you have need because of the struggles of the economy during this time, uh, please let us know how we may help and serve you. And now I invite you to join me in praying as our Lord himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing the closing hymn, O Jesus King, Most Wonderful. Immediately after the service today, we will be celebrating an adult confirmation, that of Vincent Berry. And then immediately after that, we have uh, an adult Bible class that we're starting again today. We'll take a deeper look at the scripture readings for the day. We can have 10 of you in the church, and we ask that you would uh, practice all good health practices as we gather together. God bless and have a wonderful week.